Tell me the history of Bitcoin maximalism. <laughs> oh, I don't know if we have enough time for that. <laughs> you know, I have lived through it and uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure sure someone who actually researched that period. I'm, I'm wondering what kind of things I did not notice. But yeah, it, it would be a nice, nice story, I think. It's, um, you know, sociological phenomenon, uh, which is not my forte, but like you said, we've lived through it and now we're just trying to understand it and explain it and hopefully be able to get some sort of idea of where it's going from here. But I think uh, it's always going to be evolving and uh, we're going to be surprised by which you know new factions rise and fall over the years. So you wrote an article about it, right? Um, you just recently retweeted it. Mm -hmm. What's that about? I think the, the gist of it is that uh, it has uh, natural logical beginnings and evolutions over the years of how we've ended up where we are today. Uh, basically that it really spawned off of the first era of altcoins, which were just, you know, Bitcoin with a few parameters tweaked. And, you know, that's when the concept of shitcoin really arose in that, oh, you're just making a knockoff of Bitcoin that has, you know, no meaningful additional utility or value. Uh, and then it's, it's all just marketing, uh, of you trying to, accrue value and uh, you know, compete with uh, the Bitcoin network. But you know, over the years, altcoins, uh, had, the whole altcoin space has exploded, gotten a lot more sophisticated. Yes, I would say the vast majority of them are you know, cheap pump and dump scams, but uh, there are some projects out there that are actually putting in work and trying to do novel things and... Um, some you know faction of bitcoiners uh prefer to just uh remain you know focused on bitcoin and uh automatically dismiss all other attempts at doing anything with cryptography in this space so it has become i think more and more of a a virtue signaling type of issue of saying, you know, we're not even going to give other projects the time of day because we believe that in some sense or another, it's competing with Bitcoin, whether that's for the you know, monetary value or just uh, time and attention value. And, you know, Bitcoin is the only thing uh, worth uh, spending any resources on. So it seems like it's turned into less of a interesting like technical debate of whether or not any of these projects are doing interesting new things and more of a ideological uh debate and and you know those ideological factions have in some cases become more and more extreme as as new cohorts come in and i think this is a natural result of you know, self-selection and uh, narratives and mimetics evolving over the years. Um, it's not unlike any other sort of cultural or even uh, religious uh, narratives. And, you know, you can even go back in history and look at different religions and how they've forked off uh, over centuries and millennia. So I think that this was naturally going to happen um and it's just a question of you know how do we approach it um you know, are you gonna fight against it or just say hey you know this this is human sociology and you know call it out for what it is and you can choose to participate in you know whatever narratives and ideology you want you know th there are actually some some more practical things here, uh, other than, than than sociology here, because I noticed when over the years I have been, I created or and or moderated different uh, Bitcoin cryptocurrency related groups, and 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 you know, I'm I'm a busy person. I'm doing this as as a hobby and stuff, and 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 you just have. I am 
I'm a shitcoiner. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really touch shitcoins, but uh, but I'm not against them. I yeah. I hope they, they 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 can come up with something great. But uh, but you know I have to make the judgment calls, and I cannot review every single post there. So if it's if it's if it's altcoin like. I, I just gonna guess and, and delete right away and get on with my day. So that was my experience at least. Uh, even though I didn't want to push Bitcoin maximalism, I am pushing it. <laughs> I have another very interesting question for you. So as you know, I'm, I am a privacy researcher for, for 10 years at this point. And as I recall, you have had some privacy problems mm-hmm. <laughs> back in the day. Can you tell me about that? What happened? Right. So, you know, my privacy journey is interesting because it's really flipped around over the decades. Um, in my early career, uh, before I went full time uh, building Bitcoin self custody systems, I actually spent a decade as an uh, an email engineer at a marketing company, and um, specifically over the years, I went from being more of a front end developer to being more of a, a back end. Uh, large data analysis engineer. So this was like the early days of cloud computing in the late 2000s when it was just becoming a thing of what you know cloud even was. And and so essentially, I was one of the guys responsible for you know stripping away people's privacy in a sense because my task was to take. Uh, petabytes and petabytes of raw analytics information that was getting collected as a result of the emails that were being sent out and opened and uh, clicked on and tracked in a variety of different ways. And um, to basically use our large scale distributed data systems to analyze that data and provide metrics, analytics, um, and even sort of predictive algorithms that we could then sell to marketers so that they could basically more efficiently target and sell whatever they were trying to sell to the people who were most likely to buy whatever they were trying to sell. So that gave me a lot of insight into just how poor your privacy is on a day-to-day basis of using the internet and the sort of default setup that people do. And, um, you know, after I'd been in Bitcoin working for a couple of years and started to accrue a number of followers on Twitter and piss people off during the scaling debates, I ended up, uh, getting visited by a SWAT team. They uh, shut down my entire neighborhood of like 400 houses at the time because uh, someone decided that they wanted to screw with me and extort me. And that really led me to realize how exposed I was physically, you know, not just from a, a digital sense, but like people could actually physically find me and, you know, try to uh, threaten and harm me. So, it took me about a year after that incident of researching. Can you, can you slow down for a moment there? Sure. Like, uh, what happened exactly? So SWAT team went to your house, you were home, you were not home, your family. Well, what's what's going on there? Yeah, uh, I was kind of lucky when it actually happened because I, I had some slight operational security practices and that, you know, for example, when I would post something with a photo or a location, I would only do that after I had already left that location. And in other times I would post things that, uh, people might then assume that I was doing something. So for example, what happened on this day, I, it was a, a Monday morning, and 
I got up and I went to the gym as my routine was to do usually around six o'clock in the morning. And as soon as I got to the gym, I tweeted something about how it was, you know, Monday morning, we had a whole other week of, you know, scaling debate, uh, arguing uh, ahead of us and went and I did my workout, showered, came back to my house and I actually got, I ran into a police blockade trying to get back into my neighborhood. And so it took probably 20 or 30 minutes of me sitting there and then eventually, you know, talking to the police more of understanding, you know, what this sort of active shooter incident was until we realized that I was the active shooter that they were looking for. Um, and, you know, thankfully was able to explain what was going on of like, I knew what swatting was. I just, you know, never thought it was going to happen to me. And, you know, what had happened was of course the attacker, saw my tweet and assumed, you know, it's so early in the morning, I must have just gotten out of bed, I must still be at home. And so I was lucky from that sense that uh, I actually ran into the police, you know, not inside of my home, as opposed to them busting down the door with guns and uh, being, you know, hair trigger, Uh, something could have gone wrong, you know, if Myself, as a as a firearm owner uh, who actually at the time had about a dozen rifles laid out in my living room because I had been to the shooting range the previous day and I was planning on cleaning my guns. Uh, you know, it could have been you know a, a nasty ending uh, if if not for that one particular little uh, tidbit uh, of me posting when I wasn't at home. But yeah, this was a wake-up call. Um, It could have gone worse, um, and I wanted to prevent it from happening again. And that's when I really started going down the privacy rabbit hole. And what did you do? Go to another place, leave another place, not posting about it anymore, not telling friends and family to not take pictures there? (laughs) Yeah, there were, you know, a couple of different paths in front of me. I could have just, you know, deleted my Twitter account, deleted all of my online presence and gone underground and and basically no longer presented myself as a public persona that could be targeted. But I didn't want to throw away the reputation that I already built for many years under my real name. So I decided to take what is arguably a much harder path. And uh, that was basically, you know, how do I continue using my, my government name, but in such a way that I cannot be targeted by just you know, any random person who, you know, spends 20 or $30 um, going to, you know, one of the various data brokerages and name lookup services and be able to, you know, find all of my like credit information and other personal information to to then, you know, target my actual house. And, you know, the only way that I really found that that was possible was to burn down every publicly registered thing that was associated with me. So, uh, in the United States, we call it real property, uh, but that's things like your house and your vehicle, and, you know, large value assets that uh, get publicly registered and create a lot of records that then, of course, get sucked into various databases. So basically, yeah, I had to move to a different place. I had to, you know, I had to sell all of my assets that were, you know, tied to my name, all my physical assets. And then I had to purchase new assets, but not under my own name. I had to create, you know, legal trusts and corporations and structure them in such a way that my name is not on any of the publicly registered documents. So, uh, you know, any assets that I have are just under various innocuous sounding corporations and trusts that hopefully no one would uh, be able to associate with me because those names uh, are not associated with me in any other way. And the, the short version of it is I had to sort of 
look at every aspect of my life, like everything that could be used to connect to me, you know, things like phone numbers, for example, and basically set up proxies. So, you know, a proxy, you, you generally think of a proxy in sort of a technical uh, sense of like, oh, I'm going to you know, set up a proxy server that's basically rerouting traffic. But, you know, you can have proxies in a variety of different ways. Um, so, for example, I consider like even these legal entities as sort of proxies. Uh, they're basically obfuscating, you know, the true ownership of assets. For phone numbers, I have proxies where it's basically, um, I have multiple SIM cards, but I don't even know the phone numbers associated with those SIM cards. I have a sort of a ring of proxy voice over IP uh, numbers that sit in front of them that are the numbers I actually give out to various people and services. And then those, you know, forward the calls along and I can rotate these out as needed. I can spool up new ones to create, you know, essentially new pseudonyms as needed and, you know, firewall off the different aspects of my life. Um, and then, you know, even like using attorneys, friends, family as proxies for other aspects, um, it gets really complicated. And I would say that in that first year, I spent tens of thousands of dollars uh, in, in legal fees, mostly uh, to set all of this stuff up. And it is still an ongoing cost, you know, thousands of dollars a year at the minimum, just to you know, keep the corporations and the trusts going and to you know, pay for additional services that otherwise, you know, most people would not be using. You know, I might might have ended up in a similar situation regarding the Samurai people. You know, they they have been sending me death threats uh, since forever, mm. right? But the last habit that they get into is to to keep posting my my parents' address. I uh. I suspect that they think that that's that's what, that's my address, but, but I'm not sure. I mean. Anyway, so they kept posting it, and it got to a get to a point where Tdev have uh, my parents' uh, address was his Twitter location, right? So hmm. it's like holy fucking shit. But anyway, they got in jail, so no need to go to the extent that you did. Yeah, I mean that is another sort of issue of um, you know even if you set up all of this amazing privacy for yourself it's highly unlikely that you will convince your extended family or other people who are associated with you to do the same. And, uh, you know, you can't protect everybody, unfortunately. Um, all right. So this, this series is about Bitcoin and health. The reason is because I started a rejuvenation Olympics interview series. So that's about people trying to slow down their aging. And and I felt like I'm I'm moving too far away from Bitcoin and somehow maybe I could <laughs> I could bring the two together and uh and and see find some Bitcoiners who who did some something quite significant uh in in health and I recalled you had an article back in the day called Fat to Fit. And uh, and I would like to talk about that. But I would also be curious uh, what what happened since then. So yep. let me let me set the stage. A couple of years ago you you went down from I translated it to Europeans, so don't worry. From mm -hmm. 94 kilogram to 79 kilogram, uh, 34 body fat percentage to 21 body fat percentage, and 114 centimeter uh, waist circumference to 90 centimeter, and all this in four months. Mm -hmm. Now, I think 34 body fat percentage to 21 body fat percentage in four months is, 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 is the crazy number here for me. 
Yeah. And and one year later you you still kept kept it. So so tell me about that. Uh, how did how did it came about? Well, you know, it started in the middle of COVID lockdowns. Uh it was probably like six to eight months into the COVID saga. So, you know, late 2020, I started thinking, um, you know, how do I protect myself from COVID? And when I looked at the various mortality uh, metrics, it seemed to me like the, the biggest issue that you had to worry about in terms of like comorbidity is just obesity. Um, you know, the, the people who were essentially, you know, suffocating to death uh, as a result of having, you know, lung deterioration with COVID uh, seemed like uh, a lot of them were either, you know, extremely elderly and frail, or they were just extremely overweight. And so, you know, I wasn't elderly, but I knew I was overweight. And I figured the, the most proactive thing that I could do would be just, you know, improve my overall health there so that if and when I contracted COVID, I would, my body would be in a better position to fight it off. And so that's when I started looking into, okay, how do I actually do this with as least effort as possible? That was my other thing is, uh, you know, I didn't want to go crazy on having to spend a ton of time you know, counting calories and, and tracking a lot of things. Um, and so I think that was the main impetus of, you know, how, how do I do this as easily as possible? And, you know, we can get into, I guess, whether or not it really is low effort or easy, but uh, some of my own, um, I guess quirks allow me to be a bit more extreme uh, in some of my habits than maybe the average person. So that helped. But uh, I think it, it came down to you know simplicity as well as what's the most straightforward, simple way to improve my health or at least reduce my fat. Um, and so that was, that was my primary goal for that first period. And then uh, over the years, I've started experimenting with other things, uh, trying to continue to improve my health in other ways. You know, I noticed that obesity is, it seems to be honest. You have some, some, some really nasty vices, you know, mm -hmm. um, obesity is the, the single thing that one can do to lower their biological age. Um, mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's interesting. Even I, I, I might even go go that far to to say even more than than working out but you know then the variables start to confound um so 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 what's the simplest uh, least effort way to lose a lot of fat <laughs> tell us can't wait <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I think a lot of it has more to do with cutting out bad things uh, from, you know, the, the first sort of quip that you may hear a lot that I think is actually quite accurate is that you can't outrun a bad diet. And so, especially in America, you know, we have the the standard American diet or SAD, uh, you know, for acronym and, uh, you know, I think that already puts us at a big disadvantage. There's just so many ultra processed foods in America that are um, stuffed with highly subsidized uh, high fructose corn syrup and other other corn and related agricultural products that I think normally would not be shoved into these foods if the government wasn't incentivizing the farmers to produce a lot more of it. Um, so, you know, specifically I ended up choosing a ketogenic diet and, you know, that was mainly because my research concluded that, you know, when your body goes into ketosis, you really supercharge, uh, your body processing fat as a uh, store of energy, as opposed to normally it's going to be using carbohydrates uh, to actually create your energy to power your metabolism. Um, but 
you know, several years later, as I've tried a, f a few other diets, I don't necessarily believe that keto is like the perfect diet for everyone. Uh, the reason why I think that it works for a lot of people and the reason why I think it works for me is really because it forces you to be mindful about what you're eating and it forces you to avoid a lot of those uh, ultra processed foods. So, you know, basically on a ketogenic diet, it means I'm eating uh, meat and vegetables and maybe a little bit of fruit. <laughs> But, you know, just that of, you know, cutting out uh, a lot of the, you know, shelf stable products, I think is what really did it. That along with cutting out, you know, beer and, and alcohol, you know, uh, you really want to avoid drinking your calories as well. And so uh, mostly stick with coffee, black coffee, unsweetened tea and a lot of water. Uh, and so that's another thing that I also started doing is, you know, carrying around essentially a, a gallon jug of water that has my time of day markings on it uh, and making sure that I'm well hydrated. And um, I've done a little bit of fasting as well. Uh, I've, I've tried intermittent fasting. I've tried multi-day fasting and the, I think that that may be good for, you know, sort of resetting your body or it can certainly be helpful for getting into ketosis if you're not already in it. Though I found that fasting while in ketosis is far easier. You generally don't get as hungry um, when your body is running on fat uh, as its energy store. It's more of a slow burn type of thing. But um, point being with the drinking all of the water is that I found that just making sure that you're drinking a lot of water throughout the day also prevents you from getting hungry and wanting to snack because uh, water you know, does help uh, fill you up and um, especially helps during fasting periods. But while I, I did all of this without you know, specifically counting calories or looking at macros or anything else like that, I think that it was a sort of confluence of all of these other habits that resulted in me just naturally getting my caloric intake down uh, and making sure that I was, you know, burning a lot more than I was ingesting. When, when you're talking about uh, ketogenic diet, uh, do you mean like there are two types, right? Like the high fat or a high protein one? Like which, which one are you talking about here? So I was focused more on high fat at the time since, you know, the fat was the, my source of energy. I wasn't really tracking my macros or, you know, how much, um, uh, protein and, and fat I was getting at the time. That was something I started doing a few years later, though it's annoying. Uh, and I really only started tracking macros when I decided that I wanted to start adding more muscle. Uh, so, you know, this early experiment with ketosis, I was primarily focused on losing fat and that certainly worked. And I was, I, you know, I'd started going to the gym and, and w lifting weights, but not in any sort of highly regimented fashion. I didn't really know what I was doing. I didn't have any professional advice uh, or spend a ton of time, you know, coming up with a weightlifting plan. I was just going in and, you know, doing like three sets of max uh, on a variety of different uh, machines and whatever, just to make sure I was, you know, actually working out my muscles. But um, I... I don't think I really gained much muscle during that. And what I realized after sort of being plateaued there for a couple of years and trying harder to gain muscle, I realized that on a ketogenic diet, it's very, very difficult to, to gain muscle because uh, normally, you know, in order to, in order to actually add muscle, you can't just eat protein, you also need uh, carbohydrates to turn into, I think, glucose uh, to help uh, get your body into a position where it can start building up your muscles. Uh, that was, you know, 
something that I started doing last year when I actually got a professional trainer and they completely switched up my diet, which has led to a whole other journey over the past year. What about the environment that you existed in at, at that time? Like, is it is it still the lockdown COVID and you are not going anywhere or you were traveling around the world to Bitcoin conferences? I think it wasn't until probably several months, at least after I published that uh, essay that we started having Bitcoin conferences again. Um, and then, of course, uh, trying to stay in a ketogenic diet while traveling and uh, being on airplanes and stuff is also very difficult, uh, especially when you go to, to Europe. Uh, there's a lot of breads and pastas and, and so on. And uh, it can be probably almost as difficult uh, to be vegetarian, uh, you know, trying to, to stick to meat and vegetables. But uh, you know, these days I'm... Um, not actually in ketosis. I'm I'm sort of carb cycling in and out of low carb and high carb days, but not actually trying to keep my body in a state of ketosis. Um, what about the fasting that you mentioned there? Like, are you talking about complete fast or protein fasting? Yeah, uh, basically water fasting. Um, I've done up to, I want to say like, two and a half day fast, uh, just experimenting. Um, like I said, doing a, a one or a two day fast is a lot more doable. I think when you're already in ketosis and just sticking to a sort of water, tea, coffee. Um, for me, one of the, the big improvements of being in ketosis, it just feels like, uh, I have more mental clarity and, um, you know, don't get tired as easily. Uh, like I said, it's more of like a slow burn, uh, rather than, you know, when you're, you're eating, uh, sugars or carbs at a meal, you know, that'll last for a little while and then you'll kind of have a crash. And it's just, uh, more difficult to maintain your, concentration and uh keep your your general level of concentration and acuity managed uh, i have not gotten so far as to doing like a glucose you know real-time glucose monitor but one of the things that i have appreciated is sometime last year i got the uh the aura ring and so i you know, that's primarily, you know, for sleep tracking, it doesn't do as good of a job at tracking your sort of athletic metrics, but just from looking at the sleep tracking alone, I realized eating later at night, uh, drinking alcohol in the evenings, um, these are things that impact your sleep quite negatively. And, uh, so, you know, that has resulted in some more behavioral changes as well for me. And also just trying to, to stick to, um, you know, a more regularly scheduled, uh, time of going to sleep. Uh, you know, Ura gives you these, these scores every day when you wake up and I feel like they are generally accurate with just like sort of looking at how I feel myself and I can tell, you know, when I'm out too late or if I'm even having like a single uh, glass of wine or something um, with dinner, it, it has a noticeable impact on how well I sleep. And this is it's sort of like uh, I said at the very beginning, you know, there's some very fundamental things here, like far more important than going to the gym is what what are you putting into your body? What are the inputs um, if we're looking at our body as a just sort of type of a biological machine, obviously it's all about inputs and outputs. So, you know, what, what food, what macros, what, uh, level of, uh, hydration are you getting, but also on the sleep side, you know, how, how much and what level of quality is that sleep? If you don't have those really basic 
foundations, then uh, pretty much anything else you do is is going to it's not going to be as affected. And so I'm also. I mean, I've got a number of things in flight right now that I'm experimenting with. And, you know, one of them is I'm going to be trying out the the eight sleep, which is uh, basically a mattress cover to help regulate your your temperature. Uh, as I'm a really hot sleeper and uh, especially during the summer, uh, you know, sometimes I've noted I you know, get get so hot that it'll wake me up in the middle of the night. So hopefully that's just like another thing to you know, help bring more consistency to that aspect because you know if you consider you spend like 25 to 30 percent of your your time sleeping and that's a really important regenerative cycle uh for a variety of your biological processes every night uh it's it's worth paying attention to mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah you might spend uh, a month on, on on that to to actually figure out what's the right temperature for you at what time of the day right when mm -hmm. sometimes you 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 get up and go to toilet so that's when you oh, okay it's 1 a.m and it's too too cold then next day i'm gonna make it warmer <laughs> so what the most important question how many pills do did you and do you take in a day <laughs> yeah uh well, it's a funny question because it's it's more related to an ongoing new experiment that I'm doing, right? During that first couple of years, I was only taking one or two pills. Um, I was taking a ketogenic specific vitamin, uh, which had things like magnesium and potassium. Uh, there, you know, there are certain uh, vitamins and minerals that ketogenic diets tend to be deficient on, uh, and you want to make sure that. You, you get plenty of those. So uh, I think I was taking the, that ketogenic vitamin and then maybe fish oil. But about a year ago, when I started messing around with some of um, these you know, metabolic age tests and uh, you know, trying to, to look more on the longevity side of things, uh, that's when my my supplement intake exploded. Uh, I probably take over 20 pills a day at this point. And I have three or four different longevity-focused companies that I am you know, subscribed to. And you know, I do sort of blood and stool testing to, to look at various markers. Um, some of it is for gut health. Uh, some of it you know, the, uh, the microbiome health, and then, you know, the rest of it is just looking at, uh, sort of metabolic health in general, uh, trying to, to put a number on, you know, is your, is your metabolic age, you know, higher or lower than your biological age. And I haven't, I haven't really settled on how I feel about them yet. Uh, because like I said, I'm doing like four different companies at the same time to see if they're even sort of in sync with each other. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of this seems to be really early days, kind of hand wavy. The, the science is still a bit out there, uh, unproven. So, you know, I'm, I'm not at the point yet where I would necessarily point at any one thing and say, you know, this is the way that you, uh, improve your metabolic health by just like taking a supplement you know obviously i think that like drinking less alcohol helps uh the the weird thing is that some of these companies are really big on veganism and just like avoiding meat altogether and that's very difficult uh for me so red flag <laughs> yeah i don't know um I also, I went through this whole cholesterol saga, uh, at the end of last year where, um, it was, I was already having a high cholesterol from being on a ketogenic diet, which is you know, completely expected. But then what was unexpected was when I got a personal trainer and they completely changed my diet. It was basically one year ago, last summer. They changed my diet to 
uh, high carb and ultra high protein diet. So it was around 100 grams of carbs a day and 200 grams of protein per day. And um, my cholesterol actually shot up even higher. And it was so high that my uh, primary doctor wanted to put me on statins. And, um, you know, I have no history of heart issues. And I ended up having to go to a number of other doctors, you know, cardiologists and lipid specialists, and um, basically determined that the, the simple cholesterol blood tests that doctors normally give you when you get an annual physical are not quite nuanced enough to give you a full picture of what's happening with your cholesterol and with your cardiovascular health. And basically it's, it's entirely possible to have a high LDLC level, but to not, uh, you know, have poor cardiovascular health. You know, having a high LDLC could be a yellow flag and it's, you know, worth looking into more, but I, ended up having a, a CT scan of my heart to check. And I had a calcification score of zero from that. So basically I have no plaque buildup. Um, and also I got much more advanced lipid panels that do things uh, like look at your apolipoprotein B, for example, and actually look at the size of your cholesterol particles. And the reason why those things are interesting is that if your uh, cholesterol particle size is very large and fluffy, then that's generally considered safer. Whereas if you have a lot of really small particles, those particles are more likely to actually like pass through the cells of your blood vessels and you know, get basically get stuck and that's when they can calcify, start to build up plaque. And of course, that is actually what we care about is, uh, you know, preventing heart attacks uh, and heart attacks are a result of, you know, plaque building up and, and basically constricting your blood vessels. So short version is cholesterol is a very complicated thing and um, you need to look at a variety of different markers. If you have no plaque buildup, then you need to look at additional cholesterol markers to get a better understanding of what is your actual risk. It is, is your cholesterol like the bad type that will you know, build up and cause plaque? Or is it, uh, is it likely to just continue floating around your body and not cause you any problems? Yeah, I just, uh, just watched something about cholesterol today and, uh, it's a kind of kind of worms for sure. <laughs> um, you also talked about SARMs. I'm not familiar mm -hmm. with that. What's that? Right. Uh, is it selectra selective androgenous receptor modulators or something like that? Um, so SARMs. The best way to think of them is that they are. Uh, compounds, they're molecules that are steroid-like. Um, they, they help bind, you know, to your, your, your muscles, your proteins, essentially to, to help encourage more muscle growth or sometimes fat loss. You know, there's, there's a variety of different, uh, SARM compounds out there. Um, but the it's the s the the selective part that makes them more interesting than steroids so you know i'm not a doctor but my understanding is you know, steroids is basically like blasting your whole body with this signal that just says you know grow <laughs> uh whereas sarms are more uh more specific in which which cells in your body they're targeting so you don't you don't have the same level of, of risks and negative side effects of steroids, but they are riskier. Um, you know, it's SARMs are not approved by the FDA in the US. Uh, I, I'm not sure if they're approved by any other sort of government uh, regulator authorities. They're in the US generally considered a gray market thing where you're not going to 
get a doctor to tell you to use SARMs and um, purchasing them can be tricky because if you buy them, you basically have to agree that it's like not for human usage, right? Because it's only for, you know, experiments or something. So um, also similar to steroids, it's not something that you want to stay on uh, in perpetuity. Normally you do like a six or an eight week cycle. And then depending on the type of SARM that you're doing, there's uh, certain post cycle therapies that you might still want to like take various supplements uh, because they can, for example, affect your uh, testosterone levels. Um, not as badly as steroids, but you know there are still effects there. So I tried a couple of different SARMs, and uh, you know they definitely work. Um, I think the one that I found most effective was sometimes it's called Ligandrol, sometimes it's called like LGD four. Um, and I could tell when I was on it that, uh, I could generally feel like my heart racing more and I just felt more, um, uh, energetic. I could like lift heavier weights when I was at the gym. And I think it did help, you know, improve my, uh, my fat loss and possibly, you know, some addition of muscle while I was doing all of that, but I haven't done them since then. Um, and in fact, I'm going to be trying something this summer uh, with peptides, which I believe are you know safer than SARMs. But once again, this is a sort of gray market, uh, cutting edge area that's not like federally approved or anything like that. So uh, you know, I will be reporting back on that you know probably next year with the results. Which peptides? Uh, so the one that I'm looking at starting pretty soon is, uh, it's called Semarellin or Sermarellin. Um, and that's one that is you know, specifically supposed to help both with adding muscle and reducing fat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, the GLP-1 agonists are also such peptides. These are uh, new things. Had a, had a bad experience with that. Uh, turns out they raise raise well talking about ordering your your resting heart rate mm. goes up significantly every single mm -hmm. night and and your heart rate variability goes down so uh. i was trying to make it work but uh i i could not and you, you know you know what's crazy that uh it, it seems like the internet haven't even caught up to this like only some yeah. aura or of Reddit forums are talking about this. But when I was looking at like studies done, uh, it was very consistently ruining the two things. Although, well, they certainly ruined my sleep. But mm -hmm. on the other hand, there could be an argument made that even though it ruins the resting heart rate and heart rate variability, uh, the actual health outcomes are positive, but, uh, yeah. you know, I'm not gonna test it on myself. <laughs> I yeah. I mean, did. a lot of these things seem to have trade-offs. Uh, there, there is no, uh, you know, magic pill or injection or whatever. I mean, I guess, uh, some people are playing around with like metformin and Ozempic and other stuff, but, uh, that's new enough that, I, I'm kind of afraid that, you know, five or 10 years from now, a lot of studies are going to come out about terrible long-term side effects of them. That, that's why, that's why you have to take them while they are hot before the <laughs> side effects appear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so a very interesting phenomenon in, in Bitcoin. Just, just yesterday, uh, there is Max, Max Silabrand. He, there is a grill in the office and what he does is he buys a lot of meat like like meat and then makes a lot of uh meat on the grill mm -hmm. and and then serves it and here is your meat no sides no vegetables no bread no nothing uh, full here is your meat yeah <laughs> <laughs> so what's going on why why are bitcoiners so fond of meat and carnivore 
Yeah, I mean, I haven't gone full carnivore myself. Um, you know, I guess the argument is that uh, animal meat is like the most highly dense um, nutrient type of food that you can get out there. Uh, you know, because you know, in in general, the animals that you're eating, uh, they have been consuming, um, hopefully grass and you know regular plants uh that are growing out of the ground uh so that you know they're essentially consuming a lot of the nutrients from the soil that are going into the plants that are rising up that are then being eaten uh and digested by the animals and then so the the animals and their meat themselves is a sort of higher order level of food as opposed to you know us trying to directly eat the plants ourselves and process that um, there's some interesting arguments to it. Uh, you know, I think we both know a number of people who have essentially been living on the carnivore diet for several years. Um, I don't think I would really want to do that myself for one, because I mean, I think you need fiber at the very least. Uh, you, you're gonna probably have some digestive issues, at least, uh, what I've read from other, a number of people who did carnivore long term and then ended up stopping uh, was usually due to various digestive issues that came up. But once again, this is the type of thing where I don't think that there's one diet that works for everyone. Um, I did read an interesting book a year or two ago. That I think it was basically called uh, Eat Right for Your Type. And the author in, of that book made an argument that your blood type can actually be an indicator of like what the best type of diet for you is. And this is, um, it is kind of hand wavy science. It's more of a like, uh, almost archeological or historical look at, uh, human civilization and the arguments that they were making were, you know, if you're, if you're this specific blood type, then your ancestors, you know, probably came from Asia and were mostly used to eating these types of foods. And you, therefore your, um, digestive system has evolved more to be, uh, you know, of that type of food. And, you know, I, I think it, it made sense, but once again, it's not necessarily like great peer reviewed, uh, and tested science. Uh, but I will say that that book said that, you know, with my blood type, uh, uh, which is type O, uh, that ketogenic diet works really well for people of blood type O, uh, because we were historically more of the hunter gatherer types. So, uh, you know, uh, societies that would be semi nomadic and, uh, mostly chasing animals, eating meat, and then also foraging, uh, for plants from time to time. Like I said, I, I think that people kind of need to experiment and figure out what's best for them. Uh, everybody's body is different. And so this is why I don't go around saying, oh, uh, everyone must eat ketogenic diet or everyone should be a carnivore or so on and so forth. So w one of the most important question is, so everyone can lose weight, right? I can, I lose weight like three times a year I go down 10 kilogram, but, but then, then, then I always come back. So, yeah. And you aren't. So how, how did that happen? Uh, you know, I think that it has to do with how strict you're willing to maintain, uh, whatever things you put in place. So, you know, for me, the nice thing about keto was that I could basically eat whatever I wanted until I felt full. Uh, so eat a lot of meat and vegetables. If you're hungry, eat more. And that it, it generally was not going to add uh, more fat to your body itself because your, your body is in uh, you know fat processing mode. You know, if, if you, for whatever reason, you know, don't have the ability to stick to more strict regimens of, uh, diet and exercise, then it can be a lot more difficult. And, um, it's not for everyone. Uh, you, you mean you're this speaking is... to your diet for a very long time already? Huh? Yeah. Also, uh, as I think I stuck to that diet pretty strictly for 
two and a half, three years, you know, up until a year ago. Uh, now, I guess what I didn't mention, you know, when I when I changed up my diet a year ago and I got the personal trainer, I gained uh, a lot. <laughs> um, and I, but I was also trying to bulk up. That was that was the whole idea: was eating high carb, high protein, and and adding a lot of muscle. But it also added a decent amount of fat as a part of that process. So you know, now once again, um, experimenting with trying other things. Where um, right now, from a weight perspective and a body fat perspective, I am higher than I was, uh, you know, eighteen months ago, and I'm I'm still trying to improve of you know, adding muscle and losing fat. So that's like one of the reasons why I'm looking into peptides to see, you know, if they can help. It's very difficult to both add muscle and lose fat at the same time. Uh, you know, everybody wants to do that. But uh, as I saw for the experiment with the last half of last year, when I added muscle, I also added a lot of fat. Um, and I could cut, but I would be afraid that if I went back to my hardcore strict keto diet yes i would definitely lose muscle but or i would lose fat but i would probably also lose muscle um and that's one one thing that i have noted amongst uh, the people that i'm familiar with that stick to strict carnivore and strict keto diets they tend to be pretty lean um you know not uh not very high on on the muscle side of things it seems to me just from sort of anecdotal experience, looking at my own body, looking at other people who are very strict about low carb diets that, um, you know, if you are going to do that, it's going to be pretty difficult to, to have a, a higher level of muscle. And so, you know, that's what I'm trying to go for right now. I did the lean thing for several years and I just want to see, you know, how can I reshape my body? Uh, I think this is this is kind of what any of us who are interested in health are trying to do is we're just playing around with inputs and trying to figure out, you know, what are the inputs that lead to these outputs? Um, and, you know, I haven't found the the perfect setup quite yet that is working for me. But, you know, there is a lot of different variables that you can play around with. There is this training philosophy that maintenance is a myth there is no no maintenance there is only cutting and working maintenance hmm. doesn't exist <laughs> it's just mentally too challenging um another thing that you mentioned is the is the food the food is getting worse now there is an interesting theory here that uh, you know, inflation is making food worse, mm -hmm. um, almost like directly, because there are these things, the prices are always sticky, and they never want to go up. So instead of you, if, if you're selling, selling a product, and you have two choices, you either uh, make your product as a food product more expensive on the shelves, or you can cut some corners. Maybe you can put some things in it that's booking instead of the expensive ingredient, you know? Mm -hmm. Like so So yeah, bit Bitcoin solves your diet as well, turns out. Yeah, I mean there's uh your shrinkflation, uh the, the you know, package sizing is generally getting smaller while keeping the prices the same. And then there's just sort of the issue of fillers. For example, like we've even seen with uh, a lot of the grated cheeses in America using uh, basically cellulose, or in other words, you know, plant material, uh, and putting that into the cheese as a filler. And um, you know, since I was pretty much avoiding a lot of processed foods, my actual grocery bill has gone up significantly, you know, especially for the price of a steak. Uh, you know, they they can't really do any tricks to, uh, to make steaks seem cheaper. They can't really cut them much smaller. Uh, it's very obvious. 
Um, but they can't really fill them with anything. And so, you know, the, the stakes that I was paying less than $20 for before the pandemic, I'm, I'm easily finding myself paying, you know, over $40 for today. And it's, uh, it's the cost of eating healthily, unfortunately. I am actually wondering if you are familiar with the, the contrarian question of Peter Thiel. Uh, not off the top of my head. So the idea is that things that very few people believe to be the case and you believe strongly to be the case because you your unique experiences made you see the evidence about about a concept, about a thing, about anything. Now, those things are the most valuable because that's where you have, um, that's where you have, th that's where you are ahead of the market. Yep. So my question to you is, what is the thing that you strongly believe to be the case, but very few people agree with you on? I mean, I normally would have said that was around Bitcoin, but that has you know changed a fair amount over the past few years. I would say these days it's mostly privacy. Uh, it's almost nobody understands the value of privacy, probably because they haven't been sufficiently burned by it. You know, this is just another thing that I track all of the time or various uh, data leaks. And um, if anything, the you know amount of information that seems to be getting leaked and passed around only seems to be increasing over the years and so the question becomes you know how are people going to react to that and so far it still doesn't seem to be bad enough that uh, many people are are putting effort into improving their privacy or, or even thinking of it as like a security issue so Obviously, I'm, uh, well, both of us are f in a fairly unique situation in how we've been targeted. And so I think we understand it. Um, and it's difficult, I think, to make other people believe that something like that could ever happen to them. Yeah, privacy doesn't matter until it does. Also, it's, it's not, I'm, I'm more worried about, uh, rather people not valuing highly their own privacy they are trading it for for all kinds of stuff but uh, but but what's what's problematic for me is that privacy development is getting criminalized yeah and like how do you take care of your privacy when other people are not allowed to build privacy to tools in the first place like you have no options yeah i mean uh Part of the problem with privacy is that, let's see, how does the, the quote go? You know, it privacy only extends so far as the cooperation of others in society, right? Privacy has a lot to do with, you know, interacting with other people and doing so in such a way that, you know, those interactions don't get broadcast to the rest of the world. But it, it's kind of reliant on both parties of the interaction uh, working to maintain that privacy and not leaking that information to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when you're sharing an information with someone else, right? But uh, you, you can also consider privacy as an ability, your ability to selectively reveal yourself to the world. In that case, you remove the other party because the other party can do anything. They can try to breach your privacy like this, but 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 you can't see me. You can't see me. Uh, I I can I can I can go into the philosophy of privacy and <laughs> talk a lot about it. But uh, let me ask my final question to you. <clears throat> so since we are both capitalists here, I assume. Yeah. What is that? What is the value that you are bringing to the marketplace? What is that thing that people can pay money for you? Yeah, I mean, at a high level, I provide security services. You know, this, the fundamental point behind Bitcoin is, you know, getting rid of trusted third parties. And unfortunately, a lot of people who come into the space, their sort of default journey is they sign up on an exchange, they uh, you know, buy some Bitcoin, and that's it. And so... 
you know, that's automatically putting people into a situation where they're dealing with trusted third parties. You know, if this is the default, we're just recreating a different version of the banking system that uh, happens to run on top of a blockchain. Uh, but, you know, where a lot of those interactions are just occurring in, uh, you know, centralized databases. So, you know, I like to believe that I am helping to uh, improve the the ethos and you know, the general decentralization of Bitcoin ownership, which will uh, create just more robustness for the entire network and ecosystem. Uh, the sort of flip side, worst case situation that I want to avoid is one in which the vast majority of people who consider themselves Bitcoin owners are only owning IOUs in these centralized databases. And if, if a significantly large portion of Bitcoin ends up falling into the hands of a few custodians, you know, there's potential governance issues there. There's potential systemic risk, uh, you know, against governments and nation states coming in uh, and basically using those custodians as choke points. Uh, so, you know, from that perspective, I, I see it as uh, adding value to Bitcoin overall, just by us helping onboard more people into self custody. And you know, it's a it's a convenience issue. You know, the reason why I think people don't go into self custody is because there's a learning curve. Uh, there's responsibility that you have to take on, and people are afraid that they're going to screw up and shoot themselves in the foot, and they're going to lose all their money. So, you know, this is kind of going against the grain of human civilization in a sense. Because we've built up civilization, our society in general has scaled via trusted third parties, via outsourcing to specialists. Uh, this, you know, the ability to specialize in doing one niche thing makes you much more effective uh, in general and allows us to you know, scale up organizations and to continue to progress our technology at an amazing rate, but it introduces fragility into the system. And we need to get more people to be willing to take on some responsibility to be their own bank. But I would say that, you know, CASA's primary goal is to reduce that learning curve, reduce the friction and the level of anxiety that comes with self-custody because we basically help people avoid a lot of the foot guns, a lot of the ways that you can screw up just due to ignorance and na naivete and, uh, you know, getting more people into a sort of assisted self custody situation, I think is going to be good for the entire ecosystem. James Sonno, Bitcoin developer and from two days on a fitness influencer. That was great. <laughs> Thank you very much. You bet. Thanks for having me.